Hello and welcome to this episode of Career Shorts, hosted by the Antibody Society, where we talk to a whole host of individuals from various sectors, including industry and academia, to gain their valuable insight and advice into how PhD students and postdocs can navigate the tricky world after their studies. In this episode, we're talking to Dr. Alex McPherson, Senior Principal Scientist at UCB. Now, these episodes and more are all available directly on the Antibody Society website and all our social media pages. So we hope you enjoy and you find this a valuable exchange. So let's get into it. So hi, Alex. Welcome to Career Shorts. Um, thank you very much for taking the time to be with us today. Um, I was wondering if we can start off by you telling us a little bit about yourself. Sure. Um, my name is Alex McPherson and I work for UCB, which is a, a medium-sized pharmaceutical company, and they're based in Belgium, uh, the UK, and the US. Uh, and within UCB, I work as a senior principal scientist. So I've been at the company quite a long time. I've been about, about 13 years at UCB, and I've done sort of loads of different jobs during that time, which I'm sure we'll come on to shortly. Yeah, and I guess kind of just jumping straight in and this next bit, so bear with me, it will be a little bit long, but um, I kind of I had a quick look at your LinkedIn profile and I, I thought it was quite interesting that after your bachelor's, you one of your first positions was working as, an, uh, as a scientist in industry at Huntington Life Sciences. Um, before you moved to your current role, you've, as you said, you've been there for a few years now at UCB, um, where it seems that you've also recently um, done a PhD. So I thought there was quite a lot, I think that this, whole, this, this is all interesting, there's quite a lot to unpack. So I thought um, just to start off with, um, maybe we can start by talking about uh, why after your bachelor's you went into industry rather than kind of the quote unquote normal master's PhD, for example. Yeah, definitely. So I think when I was a, a student, I, I certainly didn't have the sort of passion for science that I that I had now. I think I'd probably say I was a fairly late developer. And really it was, for me, it was when I got a job in industry that things started to, to come together. So I think when I was a student, um, I did have a couple of uh, lecturers and things who maybe suggested that I should think about a PhD, but there was, I don't know, there, there was never real, you know, I was never really sort of pushed in that direction. Um, and when I finished, I, I got a job um, in, a, in a lab that was running immunoassays at uh, Hunting Life Sciences. And basically there I learned to do sort of probably the most important thing in science, which is accurately move around small volumes of liquid. So I did, did that a lot. And, you know, people, people said, uh, uh, you know, that I was, uh, I sort of learned the, the assays and things fairly quickly. And they, you know, said, you, you know, quite good at this, you can have a career in it. And then when I sort of realized that I, I could be good at it, I, I sort of, I don't know, it sort of ignited the, the interest and the, and the passion. And I, then sort of moved from HLS, which was a, which was a CRO, which was it was great. I mean, I, I learned a lot there practically about you know lab skills and everything else. But sometimes at, at certain CROs you can't access sort of the, the science behind what's going on. You're just you know your things are often blinded. You're, you're testing things. You might not even know in certain cases what the you know what the what the disease is. Um, and so I, I moved to UCB, and initially when I moved to UCB. I worked in development. So this is in kind of the the sort of later stage of the organization where you're dealing with 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 molecules that are in the clinic. So typically you're working to to good clinical practice, good good manufacturing practice. Uh, and I learned a whole a whole you know load of different skills there. Um, but ultimately I didn't really enjoy um, GMP work. I found it a bit restrictive. Um, but during that time, I'd, I'd worked in Slough for a few years and I worked in, in, in Brussels in, in our site in Belgium for a year. Uh, and I came back to, to work um, at, at, in research at Slough. And uh, from that was probably around 10 years ago. And, and from there, things have just been amazing. It's been, it's been genuinely really, really great. And I found sort of my niche. I found what I enjoyed, what, what was stimulating for me. Um, I found an environment that I really liked. Um, and I'd be very lucky, you know, to be given opportunities like doing the PhD and, and all that kind of stuff, you know, in, in research there. So. And I guess you've kind of touched on it briefly um, 
it's about what drove you to do to, to do a PhD. Um, but maybe you can expand a little bit more on that if if you would. Yeah, definitely. So if you if you work in industry, the way that things are organized is slightly different maybe to an academic group where um, typically you'll have groups that perform different functions. So you might have a group that makes protein, a group that runs screens or a group that discovers antibodies, etc. Um, and what tends to happen is that as you progress through your career, you become more and more expert in one particular function. So, so I was a in vitro pharmacologist. So basically I was running effectively screening assays for antibodies of small molecules. Um, and so I think I, I learned, you know, a lot about interpreting assay data, about mechanisms of compounds, about classical receptor pharmacology, but I didn't know how to make a protein. I didn't know how to crystallize a protein. I didn't know how to discover an antibody. I didn't know how to do any of those, any of those things. So quite often you'd be in meetings, um, and you would hear people talk about what they were doing and you'd almost, or I used to anyway, I used to feel a bit in awe of these people who could crystallize proteins or could discover antibodies or could do all of these types of things. Um, and when I was given the opportunity to do the PhD, I'd, I'd, I was quite late in my career actually. So I, I did my PhD when I was 34, 35, I think. Um, and by that point I was a principal scientist. So I'd, I'd already progressed relatively high or reasonably high, I suppose, in, in the organization. But I, I didn't really, well, I didn't feel that I had a very, a very good breadth of, of knowledge. I was, I, was, I was very good in a specific area. And I think doing the PhD, the thing that, that it, well, I think two things really, broadening my practical understanding of different, different um, processes, different, different areas of biology, but also I think just about resilience. You're just doing a big project on your own. You know, you're working independently, things go wrong you have to suck it up you know and, and all these kind of things so i think those have been the, the two the two things and i actually had right i think when i started my phd and I, and I spoke to friends and stuff some of my friends were like oh do you you know do you need to do one now do you you know you're probably better off just just keeping doing what you're doing and, and i can honestly say i think it was the best decision that i made and also um i think it was the best decision to do one later for me because i think for where i was i think if i'd gone straight from my undergrad and I'd, and I'd started a PhD I don't think I'd have probably been the best PhD student but but coming to it later in life when I was more infused when I, I had all this experience behind me meant that I got so so much more from my from my PhD and it was you know it was very successful and it's it's actually helped my career here because you know the work that's undertaken during my PhD has, has now transitioned into what I do as my job at UCB now so it, it set me up really really well. That's really interesting. I mean, would you be able to touch a little bit on kind of getting the logistics of the PhD whilst you're employed by, by a company? And just kind of a, like, just as a general note, I think like what you've talked about, I think is very powerful for a lot of people that are listening, if that makes sense, because um, it can sometimes feel like if you don't, you're kind of time restricted to do a PhD. Like if you don't do your BSc, MSc, PhD, or BSc, PhD, kind of like you've missed out, that's it, the train has gone. You kind of, sometimes there's that pressure that if you, you have to do it now, otherwise you kind of never do it again. And so I think it's, I, I think this is like, it's a cool story to, to, sh to share, to show that, you know, in fact, as you said, it, it took time for you to be ready and be able to prepare, because I mean, it's four years of your life that you're committing to. And yeah, so anyway, my original question, you can touch on that as well, but my original question is kind of like the logistics of getting a PhD whilst you're working for a company. But okay, feel so free I'll, to attack <laughs> I'm gonna I'm gonna address that. I'm gonna speak to the second point first because I think I think you're right, because I think it's actually can be beneficial if even if you even if you're you know you, you you're adamant that you want to do a PhD, you know, as soon as possible and, and then go from there on to you know a career in academia or a career in industry. It's not sometimes it's not a bad thing after your BSc if you can get a job, you know, even if it's a, you know, a, 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 what's the word, um, like a, a one year placement or something like that at a firm or, or in a in a lab, you know, and then when you come to apply for PhDs, you can potentially get into a better lab because, you know, you might get on a paper from from where you are or, you know, you can talk about, you know, you know, techniques and things that you've learned. When you're in that in that lab so so i think actually delaying it a small amount is, is not a bad thing anyway um and it probably makes you a bit more a bit more marketable um but yeah like l later on i think um when i when i um 
so I was yes, sort of 34 when I did it. Um, and I always thought I wouldn't be able to do one because I've been at the company for so long that obviously quitting my job, you know, when I've got a mortgage and everything else to go and, you know, to go and earn, you know, or take a significant pay cut to go and be a student didn't seem something that was, that was feasible. And I was very lucky because UCB has this, this scheme, which, um, essentially they, they try and develop their, their, you know, their, their talented graduates through giving them PhDs basically. Um, and effectively what happened to me is that I was, um, so I, I worked in the screening group to jump back slightly. I was working in the screening group. Um, and there was a lot of very exciting work going on around at the time on, around small molecules that I was involved in. And we were leading a project and the project was going fairly well. Um, and we transitioned through a decision point. Um, and effectively the, you know, my, my bosses came to me and said, look, I think you've done a great job on this project, but it's kind of, you know, it's getting a bit big now and we'd kind of like to give it to these more senior people to run, but we, we, we don't want you to feel that's a, you know, any, any negative reflection on you. We'd like to develop you. How do you, do you feel about applying for this, for this PhD? So I had a, uh, he, he wasn't my boss, but he was a sort of a, a, a bit of a mentor, someone that I, I worked closely with and, um, him and I put together a PhD proposal, which focused on, on looking at a subset of bovine antibodies, which is sort of what I've been more or less working on since. And, um, yeah, and, and we put the proposal together, it got funded, and then I had the best sort of three years. So we've had a really good supervisor. We worked with uh, a guy called John Banton Nelson at the University of Bath. He's just like a, a great scientist and a really lovely man as well. So I had a really nice um, academic supervisor, a really good industrial supervisor. And then I had three years of, you know, just having all of the, all of the, um, the power and the, you know, the, the, um, the facilities and equipment of UCB behind me. Um, and I could undertake blue sky academic research. And it's, it's actually really good for the, for the company as well, because obviously they can, not only do they get a chance to, to kind of develop people and, and hopefully tie those people into longer careers, but also, um, they can, it's an opportunity to do projects that, that maybe are a bit blue sky or a bit kind of outside the core business. So by giving people the opportunity to, to work on those things, I mean, you know, you know, you know, patents and papers and, and things come out of that, out of that work. So, um, yeah, so that's how it happened, happened to me. Um, and I think, you know, I don't know about other companies, but I know that, you know, if you, if you join UCB, you know, there is an opportunity as maybe one a year, one place a year for one of these, one of these schemes. So, you know, it's a chance to kind of, you know, write your own proposal, see if you can get it funded. It's just a, it's just a really good, good opportunity basically. Based on your experience, um, how are the opportunities available to someone shaped by the qualifications uh, they have? Do you have, yeah. Yeah, it's actually, I mean, that's a really good, a really good question. So you need something to get you in the door. So you need to have, like, I think, you know, the minimum kind of entry requirement is a, is a BSc. So you need to get a degree, right? I mean, that's, you know, the basics, but I mean, actually now what we do do is we, um, there's a, a scheme an apprentice scheme that the government runs, which is absolutely fantastic. So we take people after their A levels and, and they'll do their BSc with us. They'll work three days a week for UCB in the lab. And then two days a week, they do their college work. So after five years, they've got a degree and instead of incurring, you know, huge amounts of debt while they're doing that, they're getting paid a, you know, a modest amount and, and you know, they, when, the, when they finish their degree, they've got all this, you know, all this stuff on their CV that makes them employable. So, so I would say that, um, I would say that, yeah, I, I suppose it, the, the barrier for entry for science is getting, is getting lower, I think, well, you know, sort of all the time, but, um, but yeah, I would say that, um, I would say, I mean, advice wise, I think the PhD was the best thing I've, I've, I've done. I honestly, I can't recommend it enough. I can't speak highly enough of it. I would just say, do it at a time that's, that's right for you. And don't be afraid to, to go and get some real world experience in industry. And I think when we hire people, um, it depends a bit on the role. I think, you know, you might have a job where, you know, you're doing a lot of, for example, you're just gonna be running a single assay all the time and actually hiring someone after their PhD, it's maybe not the best opportunity for them because they'll get bored. They'll, you know, be a bit restless. Whereas I think if you, if you can get people, you know, after their degree, they could do that for a year or so. They learn a lot and then they can move on to other opportunities. So, so I think there are 
lots of opportunities at different levels. And I think one thing that I've noticed sort of when we advertise roles at UCB, quite often you'll advertise a, you know, a research scientist role or something, and you get people with, you know, three postdocs applying for this research scientist role. And while that's great, you can have someone really experienced doing the role. You kind of have to think about, well, how happy are they going to be in it? Is it the right person? Everything else. Um, so yeah, did I answer the question there? Or did I ramble yeah, a little I bit? Think, okay. No, <laughs> All right. I, I, no, and I think there's something to be said about uh, getting a little bit of practical experience because I think it sometimes when you do this is speaking from my experience like as you're doing your bachelor's it can sometimes be very heavy in the theory or you don't really see the kind of the application of what you're learning into the practical aspects of, of doing research in science and it was yeah. only when I did I did a position as a research assistant that I kind of started to get a little bit of a taste for that um and it just yeah I think I think there's a lot to be said with the apprenticeships and stuff to get that little bit of experience just so you can make like you like you found when you after your when you had your position in industry you started to get that flavor and taste for science and you started to enjoy it so like I think yeah I think that was really valuable advice and kind of just like moving on now into your current role and, and of course allowing for IP protection and confidentiality <laughs> and all, all, all that good stuff. Um, would you be able to share with us a little bit about what you do now, your what your role is, what your um, research focuses on, and especially for all of us, you know, what does it mean to be a principal scientist? Huh, okay. Um, so in terms of in terms of what my my role is at, at UCB, so I've always worked on the interface between sort of chemistry and biology. So um, I used to work on small molecule projects that try to that try to inhibit uh, PPIs, so traditional like, antibody type targets. I did that for years, um, and some of that thinking kind of bled into my PhD. So my PhD was looking at a subset of bovin antibodies that have these ultra long CDR threes. So they've they've got this like cysteine rich mini domain, which is in one of the CDRs. And my work, my PhD, basically isolated those as as, as antibody fragments. Um, and this kind of raises the possibility of, of producing them by chemical synthesis. You can incorporate non-natural amino acids and we can, we can you know, discover them by various display technologies and we can use them in protein engineering and we can do, we can do loads of stuff with them. So, so my role now after my PhD, I finished my PhD um, sort of at the start of this year, January this year. Um, and my role since then is I, I work in the immunology TA. So, um, Typically within, within research, you'll have a discovery organization, which is responsible for discovering and characterizing molecules. And you'll have a, a therapeutic area, which kind of directs, you know, the, the, it kind of decides the direction of the discovery engine, really. Where, where does it go? You know, what's it going to work on? What kind of targets? Those kind of things. So I work in the, in the immunology TA, um, and I kind of explore, I work very closely with colleagues in discovery, um, and I kind of look for opportunities for kind of, um, non-classical antibody modalities, alternative modalities within immunology. So one of the challenges around immunology is, is we kind of understand a lot of the biology and there's sort of every path where you look at, there's interventions in sort of every, you know, every point possible really. So how do you continue to make differentiated medicines within that kind of space? So um, to do that, it typically means taking on more challenging targets um, and, you know, more, maybe more challenging um, um, disease or pathologies and things so for that we need new formats and we need we need new new approaches and that's kind of what i what i work on basically um so to be a, a principal scientist um it's really just being a manager so typically uh at ucb you kind of have a, a research scientist senior scientist should be lab based and then you could be a principal scientist which is the same grade as a as a group leader and some people stay in the lab and they, they just become technically more expert they instead of maybe influencing one project you're working across projects across teams you're kind of you know pulling pulling groups and ideas together um and then you can either go a few different ways you can either go down that group leader role and be a people manager you can go down the associate you know the director or the associate director role and kind of look into more of a i don't know like a strategic and kind of business focus or you can go keep going down the scientist role which is what which is what i've done so so i'm now a now a senior principal scientist and um effectively i work across a range of projects i have uh, i've just got a really great guy who started working with me he's he's brilliant so we you know have a lot of fun working with him in the lab as well so i get to do a bit of everything i get to i, I really do i get to you know work in the lab i get to, to work on projects and, and work with 
with sort of senior management and stuff as well. So um, yeah, that's what it means. It might be different other companies, but that's kind of how I've understood it at, at UCB. Yeah, I think that's pretty cool. And I think first of all, your re the research that's being done is pretty awesome. And I think the fact that kind of in your position, you get to do the Western blots, but you don't have to spend not the Western blots. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> just I hate Western, Western blots. blots. I hate my brain. <laughs> You get to look yeah. and, and be a part of the science without having to spend hours doing a Western block, for example, and kind of yeah. get the interface I, between different. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, it's funny. I mean, I do. I do. It's funny because you do spend. Uh, it, I tend to pick up a lot of the time things that maybe aren't as important, like stuff that you want to do, like you'd like to see this experiment, but maybe, um, say, Michael, who works in my group, maybe his time's better, better off spent doing something else. So I'm like, OK, I'll get in and run that. You know, I'll just put that on. And so it's a lot of like kind of speculative, kind of slightly under the benchy type stuff. And then also a lot of the time just just pitching it and helping when stuff he's doing. So. Um, so, yeah, I mean, you do. It is it, it, it's a very good um, sort of position to be in, really, because um, I think it's nice to be able to, to, to work in the lab, but also have some say over the direction that your experiments go in, you know, yeah. rather than just being told, to, you know, go and do that. So. And what skills have been the most challenging for you to develop? Um, you know, especially as you've progressed through kind of more senior roles. Um, what's been your experience in transitioning um, to more leadership position? Probably, probably the well. I think the one I think everyone struggled with early in the career is confidence. I think that's the most difficult thing to kind of you know develop when you're when you're younger. Um, you know, having faith in your own opinions and trusting your own you know kind of scientific thoughts and stuff. Um, and I think. Latterly, for me, I think um, learning to be a people manager is is very difficult because um, uh, I think it's something you're not taught. And I think one of the downsides of, of industry is you tend to promote people on scientific ability. And so historically, that meant that you ended up with great scientists who weren't always the best the best people managers. Whereas I think now that's changed, and I think there's a lot more focus on soft skills and you know people management and all of these kind of things really so i think for me that's something that i've you know had to pay a lot more a lot more attention to um just because it's you, you, you know you don't you spend years training to be a scientist but you don't necessarily always get that same training to be a manager yeah do you have any advice for you know if if you were speaking to your younger self for example something that you would have told yourself to do to maybe put yourself in a better position now in, in that regard or is yeah, it just something I, that you pick up with time? I think so. I mean, there's one there's one bit of advice that someone gave me that was quite good, which was basically that um, if you keep doing good science, eventually you're going to get lucky. And I think that's quite important. So I, it's quite easy. Sometimes, you know, you're, one of your colleagues like discovers an amazing molecule or gets a great structure or whatever, and everything you're doing isn't working. <laughs> so you're kind of like, you know, you're like, oh God, this is terrible. But actually, if you keep, if you keep going, then eventually you're going to get, you're going to get lucky and you're going to, and, and there's been a couple of things, you know, that I've, you know, really good bits of data that I've got over the years. I'm like, oh, that was amazing. And actually, you know, getting that data was worth, you know, all of the months of terrible, terrible stuff beforehand. So, um, yeah, so probably just that really. And I think everything else just, you know, just stick in there and keep going and sort itself out really. Yeah, and I, and I guess on a, on a good note, what kind of gets you out of the bed each morning uh, to get into work and to do what you do? <laughs> um, I genuinely I genuinely do really like my job. I really do like my job and I like the people I work with. So I think that's those two things are, are good. Um, and I think that's probably, that's it really. And I think, um, you know, I've, I have a job where I enjoy what I'm doing. And when I go home, I think about it in the evening, not to the point where it's unhealthy, but, you know, sometimes I'm walking the dog and I'm thinking about, this problem or that problem and I think that's what you that's what you want from a job is it something that engages you and I think you know there's there's you, you get that with science don't you so I think that's it and has there been any new development or finding that's kind of really stuck with you over the past few years it's okay if it hasn't because it's kind of like I'm just, um, this out in the blue but I suppose I don't know there's not really been any one like one particular like scientific discovery that's that you know but there's always there's always something like when I was doing my degree it was all about you know sequencing the human genome and then you know there's been like CRISPR there's been things come along that's just a paradigm shifting um but I think 
um, you know, alpha fold maybe now, but I think there are more things that contribute, you know, to the overall kind of richness of what we do rather than being, oh, it's, it's just maybe change direction completely and just do that one thing. So, uh, yeah, so probably not anything in, in, in particular, but I think certainly over the, over the years where I've been at, at UCB, the site's got a very strong antibody focus. So even when we've been working on small molecules, there's always been like a, like an at like a kind of a structural and then a kind of an antibody kind of vein running through everything that we were doing. So I think that's probably been a sort of a continuous sort of presence, I suppose. And are there any particular opportunities in you know research and development that you think students or early career researchers uh, should be aware of? So I think if you if it's not too late and you haven't started your degree, I would say definitely look out for apprenticeships. I think they're they're really, really good, a really great opportunity. Um, I think if you're doing a degree, year in industries are fantastic. Any course with a sandwich year, whether that's a, a master's or a um, or or, a, or, or an, just an undergrad, is is, is great. Um, and I think other than that, really, just just anything that gets you a, a foot in the door, you know, anything that gets you in, that gets you some lab experience, that just makes you makes you more employable. Because I think it's the first getting the first job, which is the the toughest one, really. And, you know, as you recruit new scientists, new people into your group, um, what sort of characteristics or attitudes are kind of more, most valuable that, that you look out for? Um, I would say someone who's enthusiastic, someone who's prepared for the interview, someone who's actually bothered to read some of our papers and find a bit about what the company does and has actually made the effort to do that. Um, and someone who you think would be hardworking and who would get on well with the team. I think those things, I think if you're enthusiastic, you, you're well prepared and you get the impression that you, you want to, you want to learn and you want to do well and that people, you know, that you'll get on with everyone. Then I think that's, that's all you need. I think. Okay. And to wrap up, um, cause I've taken up quite a lot of your time now. That's all right. <laughs> I was wondering if you could kind of end off by, I know you've already given some advice, uh, just in a, few questions back but is there anything else that you want to say to any students postdocs or whatever about yeah any advice that you have um, for them yeah I don't know I don't know if I have any sort of specific kind of like one like big piece of advice but um I would just say that in the moment I mean certainly I'm, you know I don't know about particularly about the other parts of the world but industry is in great shape in the in the UK at the moment there's loads of biotech there's loads of opportunities in, in industry there's loads of opportunities in, in academia um, despite some of the challenges with you know Brexit and all that kind of stuff you know things are in pretty good shape so it's a great time and um, yeah just you know just just enjoy it basically and, and do what you what you want to do really thank you very much that's all right And that's all for this interview. Thank you very much for listening and we hope you found today's session insightful and valuable. If you'd like to hear more interviews like this, then please check out the Antibody Society's website or YouTube channel. Now membership is free for all students and postdocs and we have some really great value for money memberships for our industry and academic partners. Please feel free to share this video and come check us out on our LinkedIn, Twitter and YouTube pages. If you'd like to connect with today's speaker or reach out to us, then please check out some of the details in the description box below. And thank you again for listening.